You got it, yeah. Thank you everyone for having me here tonight. Um, we are dealing obviously the entire state with some weather related issues. And with that, um, even some, some of us have had some horses that got themselves in trouble. Uh, I have one here that kind of like there was ice and he kind of cut his, um, his foot, like his coronary band a little bit, but it's nothing super serious, but in the ice, helped to um, even like stop the bleeding. So I think that, you know, there's pros and cons with having so much uh, snow on the ground uh, and horses around going a little bit crazy. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Fernanda Camargo and I um, am one of the extension horse specialists. I'm just saving here this word document that I am gonna send uh, later um, and I, I'm from Brazil, and that's why you're gonna hear this accent, okay? That's very, very subtle. But, um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys tonight about first aid when it comes to horses. Can you guys see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, um, so one of the first things that I think is important for us to understand is that some people like to say that horses are suicidal, I don't necessarily love to say that because I think that when we domesticated horses and um, we moved them from, you know, the open area to being in, you know, stalls and being handled every day, I think we also have created a few things that uh, have put horses more or less, more or less, literally in danger or not. Um, obviously, it has benefited horses as well because when they are, you know, tended to the way that we do, um, they, let me see, um, they also get to be tended when something happens to them and horses in the wild obviously don't get to be tended and if something happens to them, they, uh, you know, are not going to be tended to and they die. So that's one of the things that people say, oh my gosh, do I have to feed horses? Uh, you know, how do horses in the wild do well? They die, they get eaten, they, you know what I mean? They die of starvation. So this is some of the things that people are like, when I don't necessarily love when people start comparing our horses, the domesticated horse to horses in the wild, because literally there is no way to compare. However, when we started putting horses in um, enclosed areas, we have created a few things that uh, may have been a problem, okay? So I think, first of all, it's important that for everybody that has horses uh, to understand um, horse, you know, the way that they think a little bit. So I don't think that they're suicidal, but they do have a fight or a fight or flight response that, that may be a little bit more exacerbated than uh, other herbivores. Um, so they, when they get stuck in a place, they actually uh, fight uh, more than maybe other herbivores will do. So I think that we need to understand that. Um, and let me move my little guy here because I cannot see my slides. Um, and always be prepared because like I said, you know, horse, some horses will get themselves in trouble more often than other ones, uh, but it's always good to be prepared. So uh, about first aid, we're gonna talk about several different things, uh, but you know, one of the things that I think is important for a horse owner to have is a good uh, first aid kit, okay? And I uh, started typing a document and I'm gonna send later on, it's a Word document and you know what you have in hand so first of all you need if the horse is not yours or if the horse is yours uh, but you need to have the owner of the horse information uh, at hand you have to have your veterinarian the farrier all those emergency numbers uh, easy to um, assess and when you move to a new place so say if you have um, buy a new farm it's also important to uh, contact the fire department so they know uh, where exactly you're located and you know they can faster or more slowly get to your place and it's important that you um, understand that too. Uh, for the first aid kit, uh, obviously we're gonna have to have some bandaging material, uh, so some vet wrap, uh, some four by four gauze, uh, I put here sterile, you know, uh, some of them, it's, if it's clean inside the box, it doesn't necessarily need to be sterile. Uh, animal intex for abscesses, elasticon, you know, 
towels. I'm a big fan of towels. So those towels that you go, you can buy big ones, but the ones that you buy um, at Walmart, like 10 towels for $3, those ones, they are really useful uh, in cases of laceration. Um, so they can, you know, for, for to compress the blood to stop the bleeding. And then diapers uh, for abscesses of the, of the foot, uh, diapers are wonderful, but I think it's important that we uh, get the little swimmer diapers because those ones don't get um, don't get inflated with water. They don't soak in water, okay? Because the regular diaper becomes this big the next day if the horse is put outside uh, in the grass. All the humidity in grass, the big the diaper becomes like this big, and that's not what we want, okay? So we want the little swimmer so the the, the hoof pack can maintain its form. Uh, obviously, we need to have some medications also. Uh, so I put here some, you know, wound sprays. So there's vetricin. Um, there are some sprays that are toxic. Uh, I say that, I think it's the last slide that I have, what not to use. Uh, triple antibiotic ointment, uh, chlorhexidine uh, solution. So, or uh, a, a betadine solution also. So those need to be diluted before we can actually use. Uh, so for betadine, for example, I like it to look like a weak uh, iced tea, okay? So you have to, ideally you are going to dilute it with saline, but you can dilute it with water as well. But just straight betadine to a wound will actually damage the wound, okay? Uh, stethoscope, thermometer, hoof pick, uh, latex gloves. Obviously, if you're allergic to, to latex, you're gonna get something different. Duct tape, a flashlight with batteries, and also the batteries working and not totally dissolved inside the flashlight. I ask how I know. Um, an eye mask, and I'm gonna show you a photo. Uh, there is like new goggles for horses for eye injuries, and they are really, really good. Uh, soft rides, farrier equipment, uh, just in, to prepare for anything that may happen. Twitch, a twitch is very important for people to have in hand so we can immobilize a horse. And then some medication. So you need to have a good relationship with your veterinarian so you can, so they can prescribe the medication so you can have at hand. So some medications are very important uh, to have. So some sedatives, some, you know, benamine, bute, and some antibiotics. Um, it's important for us to, you know, talk about and learn how to do vital signs. Uh, so that's TPR, so temperature, pulse, and respiration. Uh, so, you know, I, I have in the next slide what we actually do too in photos, uh, but we need to also know what's the normal for the horse. So like for, for pulse, which we can do like behind the eye, um, it's 35 to 45 uh, beats per minute is, you know, normal for horses. If it's elevated, um, it, it's a sign of pain, uh, a lot of the times colic. Uh, excitement also, um, if it's elevated and it's super hot and the horse just came in from being exercised and is not, uh, the heart rate is not going down, you know, it's, it can be, you know, pain as well. Uh, respiration rate, it's going to be, you know, anything like a, between 15, 12 to 15 to 24. Uh, if a horse is breathing too much, it can also be like, if the weather is not super hot and the horse didn't come back from exercising, it can be uh, also a sign of pain. Uh, GI sound, so that's why we need a stethoscope and we need to learn to get the GI sounds on the four quadrants uh, on both sides of the horse. So we can, you know, we should be able to hear sounds uh, and, and movement happening there. And then digital pulse, we're gonna get on the fetlock of the horse to see and increased digital pulse, um, it's a sign of, of pain or inflammation in the foot. Uh, so it's important that we understand how and, and, and know how to get the digital pulse when the horse doesn't have pain. And also when it's cold like this, we need to know that's going to be a little harder to get the digital pulse. And then when it's super hot, 100 degrees, it's going to be, it may be more, you know, uh, throbbing. And that may not be a sign of pain, if, especially if both feet are the same. Um, but this is... Um, Increased digital pulse is not just sign for laminitis. It can be abscess, for example. It can be other inflammation as well. And then obviously the mucosa, the gum color, uh, you know, needs to be pink, um, moist, and we do the capillary refill time and it needs to be two seconds or less. And this is just some photos showing, you know, like what a normal gum is supposed to look like, capillary refill time, uh, a thermometer, 
uh, I like to use the thermometer that's like six seconds because when a horse is colicking and thrashing, you don't want to be behind him or, you know, for more than that. So I think it's very important that we, uh, those thermometers probably cost $10 as opposed to like $1.99. So, you know, but I think it's important to have those. And then for um, posts, we can do posts here. We can also do behind the eye. Another thing that I think is important for everyone to know is how to restrain a horse. Uh, and the reason for that is because when a horse is agitated and has pain and a trauma has happened, um, he may, he may not, not, it's not every horse, but he may um, be a little bit out of control. And especially if there is a wound involved, and then if you have to assess, you know, the wound, you're going to have to um, keep him under control somehow. Okay, so there is different ways to restrain a horse. Um, obviously, holding up one leg. So one person holds up a leg as the other one tries to do whatever. Obviously, a horse that is in distress, um, they can pick up their leg back uh, very easily. So you can do, you know, a twitch. You can do a shank over the nose or a, or a lip chain uh, on the gum line, um, and that sometimes seems to, you know, help agitated horses. I just saw the Thin Line, uh, their brand Thin Line. I don't know if you guys know. They just put, uh, so it's like very, very soft. So it's not a chain. It's a rubbery material. And you put here and you attach to the halter of the horse. And it's supposed to, and it combs the horse uh, for the farrier, for example. Uh, so that's a way to restrain the horse as well. Obviously, a shoulder roll. Uh, I prefer the shoulder roll as opposed to like doing on the ear. On the ear, um, you know, the ear is so sensitive. We don't want uh, to, you know, uh, hurt the ear, especially it makes horses even more head shy. And a lot of horses are already head shy. And then obviously we have um, sedatives that are chemical restraint. And a lot of the times, depending on has, what has happened to the horse, we actually need that. So that's why when I said, talk to your veterinarian so they can prescribe medication for you to have in, at hand. Uh, it's um, sedative is one of them, okay, uh, for this particular reason. So you can have sedatives that are intramuscular or IV. You can also, let me see if I can mute this. And you can also have like dormosedan is one that you put sublingual. Uh, so, uh, but it, it keeps the horse sedated for about four hours, that one depending on uh, how much you give. So it's sublingual. So it's something that if you are not comfortable giving an IV injection to a horse, uh, that's something that uh, can help you as well. On that subject, okay, when we talk about colic, I need to mention about Benamine and IV injections, okay? So now let's start with some of the emergencies. Uh, now, I am not being able to see if there is anything on the chat. So if there is anything on the chat, uh, any questions, uh, somebody needs to tell me. So, but if you have questions, don't hesitate to maybe like lift, I don't know, do something. Maybe unmute yourself and ask questions. I, you can ask whenever you want, okay? I'll watch the questions, Dr. Camargo. Sounds yeah, good. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. So ocular emergencies, eyes. And this is one of the things that is probably one of the pet peeves of mine. And I want you guys to annotate that in your heart and in your brains. Eyes are always an emergency, okay? Eyes are always an emergency because a horse can, get, can become blind easily, okay? So if you see them squinting like this and if you see swelling in their eyes, if you see, it's always an emergency, okay? So if you have um, neopolyback eye ointment at home and you can uh, apply some, that's great, but that's still, the veterinarian still needs to come and take a look to see what's happening to the eye. If you have a corneal ulcer, uh, there is this disease called melting uh, cornea, melting ulcer. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's a fungal infection of the eye and the cornea literally melts and it's terrible, okay? So you don't want to get to that point. Uh, but clinical signs of eye emergency, so swollen eyelids, you can have a lot of discharge, 
uh, squinting. Uh, there is a lot of pain. I don't know if anybody here has hurt their eye before. It's very, very painful, okay? for the horse. So it is something that uh, you need to tend to kind of quickly. Uh, it needs to be seen as soon as possible because it can be, you know, like I said, it can be ulcers, uveitis. Uveitis is the uh, inflammation, sometimes infection in the back of the eye. The fungal infection is what I was telling you about. And then obviously lacerations um, is something that, you know, can happen, especially when horses are around hardware, okay? Um, if you, can give this horse, you know, some, and if you have Benamine at hand, you can give it IV or you can give it if you have paste or if you have, um, I mean, some people give the, the injectable Benamine via mouth. It just tastes so disgusting. I don't know how people can do that, uh, but it's something that you, and Benamine is the, the, the medication of choice for eye. And then the treatment, you are going to have to put whatever treatment it is. Uh, sometimes it's the triple antibiotic ointment for eye. So like the little uh, tubes of eye. One of the things that I like to do, so I don't keep contaminating the tube of eye ointment, I get one of those um, one ml syringes, like the insulin syringes, and you can put a tiny amount there and then you uh, apply with the syringe um, to the horse's eye. And one of the things that is important is that the veterinarian uh, needs to come and see what's happening. If it's just an ulcer, if it's gonna be treated just with antibiotics, uh, Benamine, uh, possibly also, or if there's going to be other medications uh, that will have to be applied. The melting cornea, okay, so this that is by that fungal infection, it needs to be tended to every two hours, okay, so that is a pain to treat. And a lot of the times we will have to uh, apply what we call the subpalpebral lavage system, which uh, a lot of horses, because it hurts so much to actually tend to an eye, which we have the menace reflex. We are, so we are not born with it, but we develop this menace reflex to protect our eyes at all costs, uh, to have somebody just come in with medication inside your eye every two hours or every six hours. Some horses just don't accept that. So you have to install uh, uh, the, the lavage system, which is a little tube, as you can see here, that goes all the way, uh, we tie to the, to the mane of the horse, and then you're going to be applying medication uh, over here, okay? So you can actually lavage the eye with saline and you can apply medication that way. That way, the horse, you're not getting too close to the eye of the horse and it's more comfortable for him. I know it looks a little weird, uh, but this is actually more comfortable for the horse than to have somebody come to his eye, especially every two hours. Now, if it is that, you know, the melting uh, cornea, one of the things that um, we recommend is that the horse stays in the hospital because it's very seldom that an owner is uh, not just dedicated, but has the time and the ability to actually go and do this every two hours for like a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, okay? So it is, as sad as it is, uh, after a week, sometimes it goes every four hours. And then after another week, it can go after eight hours. So that at that time, the horse can come back home. And these are the goggles that I was uh, talking to you about because fly masks will help too. Um, because when the horse has anything with the eye, it becomes very light sensitive. So those UV fly masks will help, but it can also catch, okay? So especially in the case of a laceration, if you had to stitch the eye, it can catch on the fly mask and then it can actually rub, you know, it, it can become a, a little bit more of a mess. So there are these things and this little girl here is a little 4 h -er in the making. Uh, her mom used to be a 4 h -er in our program and she um, is um, obviously being raised the right way. And you guys can see this horse here, it's an Appaloose and he's always a little bit semi-blind. So he actually uses this to be ridden. This can also be used um, for medication when the horse has a problem in, with the eye, but also this particular one is actually sunglasses for horses that have a problem with the light. Uh, and it can also be used um, to, you know, to protect the eye. And then the other ones, uh, this one has UV protection, so it's darker. And this one here, uh, as you can see, it's, it's hard plastic. So it stays very, very much away from the eye. And I, the reason why I like this guy here 
is because you can actually see the eye and what's happening. So you don't have to necessarily to remove because with a fly mask, we have to remove it to see, you know, what surprise you're going to have under that fly mask with the eye uh, being treated, if there was any, you know, tension in the sutures, etc. With this one, you actually can lower your blood pressure as you approach the horse uh, and you can see that the eye is doing well. Uh, if you guys have any questions, like I said, don't hesitate, okay? And I know I talk fast, but I want to be able to get over everything. Another emergency uh, is colic, okay? So colic is something that uh, the GI tract of the horse will lend horses to actually colic. The GI tract is so long, so, so gigantic. Hold on. Not only that, but it has, it has some curves, okay? And it, what we call flexures. And it also goes from like large places to smaller places, especially in these flexures. And that's when a problem can happen because you can have impaction in these areas. Now, there are colics that uh, are medically treated and colics that are surgically treated. So one of the things for us to see about colic is that um, like, for example, impactions are generally medically treated. You have to uh, over uh, hydrate, hyperhydrate this horse to try to soften uh, that impaction. But sometimes you actually have to open the horse up to actually remove. Okay. So the thing about colic, and this is what I said about Benamine, is that one of the cardinal signs for us to see if this horse, uh, if this colic needs to be taken from being treated medically to the surgical table is how the horse responds to um, treatment, okay? And part of the treatment is to give benamine and xylazine, okay? So the way that the horse responds, if, if the horse has like a, you know, high heart rate, uh, is rolling, it's looking at his flanks, it's biting, uh, and then you give the benamine and the horse calms down, the heart rate goes down, that's a good sign. A horse that has like a, you know, a, a, a twisted gut inside him, it is, it's not. Benamine is not going to help much, okay? However, one of the things about this is that um, we need to give Benamine IV in this case, okay? Why is that? Because one of the signs if the horse needs to be taken to surgery is how he responds to Benamine. And that generally with the IV is about 20 minutes, okay? If the owner gives Benamine to the horse orally, generally it takes about an hour to two hours for an oral medication to actually have its maximum effect. So that becomes a problem because now the vet arrives and the vet cannot give another dose of Benamine because it can risk, we can risk uh, causing kidney failure. So we can't just give more Benamine uh, after the oral Benamine. So I need you all, any horse owner, to learn how to give an IV injection. Now, it's, there is problems too, because if you hit the artery, you can actually kill the horse, okay? So, but it's important that you know how to give an IV injection for this particular reason. So if you have Benamine at hand to give to the horse as you wait for the vet to arrive, the vet arrives, and you're going to say, I gave Benamine at 5.30, it is now 6.15, and his heart rate is still not well, or, you know, and then we're going to assess the horse that way, okay? Um, so signs of colic, we're going to have, you know, flank watching, rolling point, thrashing. I think one of the things, too, is be very careful. A horse that's thrashing, you don't want to put yourself uh, in danger, okay? So it's important that we understand that your life is more important than the horse's life. So do not get yourself in danger when the horse is uh, thrashing. Um, so sometimes the best place for a horse to be, especially if he is uh, being like that, like throwing himself, it, you may need to walk the horse a little bit, okay, until he um, relaxes again. So if a horse is thrashing, being inside his stall is probably not the best for him because he can get himself in more trouble that way. Now I put here, should we walk the horse? And I just said that if the horse is thrashing, we probably should, okay? But not over walk the horse, okay? 
walking a horse for an hour, two hours, three hours, you're exhausting the horse. So this is a horse that may need to go to surgery. This is a horse that needs every ounce of energy to try to recuperate whatever is happening with him. And when we walk him and walk him, and I think owners need to distract themselves and they start walking this horse and it's just exhausting for the horse. So if the horse is quiet and is not thrashing, it is not wanting to, if the horse wants to lay down, let him lay down. If he's laying down and thrashing, then we can walk. If he's just laying down quietly, we want him to lay down, okay? So do not keep walking this horse to not um, use up every ounce of energy he has, okay? I put here, uh, get him out in an open area, um, not on asphalt, so he doesn't slip, so it doesn't become a dangerous situation uh, for everybody. Lacerations. Lacerations are cuts, okay? And you may have like a tiny cut or you can have bigger cuts. And we're going to see some photos uh, in the end. Uh, but what do we do in case of laceration? So it is going to depend on the location. It is what needs to happen. It is also going to depend if it's still actively bleeding or if it isn't bleeding anymore, okay? So one of the things, the lacerations, so one of the main things that we need to do is if it's still bleeding, we need to help uh, compress it to stop the bleeding. So that is the number one thing that you need to do. And that's where the towels come in so handy. So if it is, you know, you, like this guy here, you put towels on him and it, it, it's, this is a difficult location to actually, uh, you can maybe do vet wrap around and you can actually press with your hand. Uh, if it is here, you can do the towels uh, and then do uh, combined cotton is another good thing too. And you continue to add, if you continue to see frank blood coming through the towel or the combined cotton, you just add more. You don't remove to put new ones, you just add more around it, okay, until it stops. So that is one of the most uh, important things to do in case of lacerations. Now, if you uh, find your horse, you know, like this or like this or like this, uh, it's not actively bleeding anymore, I, this needs to be stitched, okay, so this needs to be sutured, call the vet instead of adding products to it, okay? A lot of products that we may have at, at, at hand um, will prevent us from being able to stitch, to suture this laceration. So um, one of the things that come to my mind, uh, some people um, use hydrogen peroxide uh, and you put hydrogen peroxide on this and you effectively kill uh, some good viable tissue right there, okay? Now hydrogen peroxide has its use in uh, horse ownership, and that's for puncture wounds. For puncture wounds, you need to shove hydrogen peroxide in, okay? But for lacerations like this, uh, it's very important that, uh, if, especially if it's clean like this, that you call the vet as soon as you can. Generally speaking, lacerations can be very well sutured if it's within the first six hours and they're not like full of manure or debris, okay? But even if they are, the vet is going to try to clean as much as they can and still try to suture part of it and maybe leave some part open because, uh, to drain because covering it, even if it's going to the heat, even if it's going to like come undone, will protect the new tissue, even if it's just for a week or two before it like it opens up again, okay? So uh, that's important. Uh, one of the things to know is um, arterial versus venous blood. Uh, so arterial bleeding is going to be squirting with a pulse, okay? And that's harder to uh, actually compress. And uh, venous blood is just like dripping. It's like a regular stream of dripping. And that's some, most of the times easier to compress, okay? So yeah, that's why I say here, both are going to need pressure, but arterial is going to need longer compression, especially depending on location and the size of the artery that got ruptured, okay? Um, so this is um, a friend of mine and this horse, Dr. Combs, this horse was in Canada, okay? And this horse is like minus a million degrees right now. And that is terrible because when it's that cold, uh, 
wounds take longer to heal because the to heal wounds are going to need blood okay and when it's cold the surface areas the blood goes away from the surface okay so this um this i mean uh, this happened they are thinking on a fence and you can see you know you have multiple different um muscle groups that are exposed. And I think she did a phenomenal job trying to cover. So one of the things that I think also I judge veterinarians is um, how well they actually clip the area. Okay, clipping the area is a, a skill that is important to have because that hair is dirty and is going to impede good healing. Okay, so when they clip the area, you can, um, cover with um, a gauze or anything so hair doesn't go inside the wound because if you guys know hair on this wound here will never come out okay uh, but you clip the area and then you try to salvage as much tissue as you possibly can uh, so i think that that's one of them some people look at this and say ah it's so extensive it's been more than six hours let's just cut this off and you know and pray to god this is not how it's done so covering it is actually better for the wound healing. And as you can see, they added drains uh, because there's going to be liquid being formed inside this wound. So it's important to drain so you don't form like an abscess uh, because all that exudate uh, can lead to bacterial infection also, okay? And this horse is going to be receiving Benamine. This horse is going to be receiving uh, antibiotics. And then one of the things that's hard about a wound like this is that how do you keep this covered, right? Because if you just put things on it, I mean, you can't vet wrap the entire horse in elastic on. I mean, it just doesn't stay. So there is linkies that you can use uh, for horses. Uh, but one of the things that I think is interesting is this, this is called like tie over um, and you just tie some ropes and like with stitches, okay, on the horse. And then you put, uh, this is the combined cotton. And then, because that way you can add whatever Manuka honey or the, the SSD uh, cream and you can put, and then you can put the combined cotton and prevent um, more injury to happen to the wound. And you can maintain the wound uh, very clean. So a wound to be able to heal needs to be free of infection needs to be free of debris, you know, dirt, uh, foreign bodies. It needs to be kept moist. Uh, and this is why, you know, I said like in the, in the cold, it's hard to keep that area moist. Um, so, but, but this is why I love the tie over um, because you can actually keep the medication on the wound to keep a, a good moist and um, good temperature environment for the wound to heal. Um, so I think that that's, Super cool. Uh, the other thing too that I want that I think everybody needs to learn to do is to do bandages, okay? Be and you need to practice this when the horse is not injured. So bandages, you need pillows uh, or quilts and a good bandage. Um, so you can, you know, when horses, a lot of the times if they need to be put in a stall, they may need uh, to be bandaged also to prevent uh, them to, uh, from stocking up. So uh, this, this photos here I got from a group on Facebook that I'm uh, part of. It's called Equine Vet to Vet. And uh, um, if you guys can see uh, wood, a plank of wood was here. Look at this. This is a four by four. Okay. And look at them. They actually put towels to prevent, to try to compress and do the bleeding. This horse here is the same. Okay. Uh, and you all can see um, this obviously needs uh, surgery. So what you do, you find your horse like this. I mean, first of all, pray that you never find your horse like this. Uh, and then, but if you do, you put the towel there and you uh, start, somebody else start hooking up the trailer to the truck because this horse needs to go to a hospital. You do not remove that, okay? Uh, the amount of splinters, that something like this can leave behind. It needs to be opened up um, when the horse is fully like under anesthesia, general anesthesia, okay? And like here, the little slinky will work. Uh, so not all the, the, the slinkies will work, uh, but this particular uh, model does. 
And one of the things that is, like I said, is common, especially on like a weather like this, when the ground is treacherous and hard and there is uh, ice everywhere, this is a common injury. So it's a uh, heel bulb laceration. And again, you need to compress. Do you see this? Those bubbles there, this is the same hook, by the way. Those bubbles there, like that's air and that's active, like bleeding still. So, okay, so you need to compress it first thing and, um, and then call the veterinarian to see what's going to be done uh, for this, okay? A lot of the times they're not going to be stitched. Um, it's hard, the, the skin doesn't, you know, doesn't approach, doesn't get close to each other very well in that area. But if we have to, you know, apply pressure. Uh, we're going to bandage uh, this hoof, and it's something that's going to be done for a long, long time. And this is why I put here: if bandage has, you know, frank blood, do not remove the bandage. Just continue to um, add more and more layers on top of it. Okay, uh, this needs to be kept bandaged for a long time because it's so close to the ground. I mean, it's on the ground. Uh, manure can get in there, you know, uh, urine and dirt and everything. And if this thing gets infected, it can take a long, long time. And I'm going to show you guys a photo, uh, a, a series of photos. Um, so this was about, so the horse had this heel laceration. He has a, a one here too. Uh, and this was about three weeks after the laceration, but the owner didn't uh, continue to wrap it. And this, the, the legs of horses are so prone to developing uh, proud flesh. Uh, so it just started to become a lot out of control and uh, look at this thing. And it, there was another photo that was even nastier than this. And I just did an ad, but what happened to this horse, they went in and actually excised everything. They went to surgery and removed this entire thing and started from zero and the horse looks uh, to be doing really well. But this is um, something that looked like this, if kept clean and kept, um, you know, wouldn't have turned most likely to this. It's just that the body starts to respond by adding more flesh uh, to, you know, this wound when it's contaminated, when it's not uh, well taken care of. This, <laughs> the whole bulb was, uh, removed look at this thing okay so this goes back again like does the hoof even regenerate does it even grow it does okay and that's the thing it does it is going to take a while okay for this hoof to look normal again so again uh you are going to need to be learning how to wrap uh feet very very well okay and keep it bandaged and closed up now can this horse go outside for the first few days? Probably not, but as no, no horse likes to be inside all the time. So you may want to do like a, a, a with panels, with like corral panels and then do like an outside stall for him. And then slowly you can turn him out, okay? Um, I put here abscesses as a form of emergency because uh, when horses have abscess, a lot of the times, um, they are not bearing weight on that leg. Uh, so they are literally three-legged lame. And the problem is there is two things that can do that to horses. One, it can be a fracture. It, he can have actually a broken leg. And the other one is abscess. Abscess is not a problem most of the time. But if the limb is actually fractured, you need to obviously have it uh, radiographed so you know what's going on and what the line of treatment is going to be. Uh, so abscesses is the most common form of lameness uh, for horses. And I think it's important, you know, can, it can be evaluated by a farrier. If you have one of those hoof testers, you can try to test it yourself, uh, but it's important to see uh, if it's not a fracture, okay? Um, I put here hoof packing is very important as well as soaking. Okay, a lot of the times, depending on the horse, he doesn't like to be soaked. So then don't fight with the horse. So just do the hoof packing. So what I, my, what I like to do for uh, abscesses, I, you can do Epsom salts, uh, like to soak. You can do, I think it's called clean tracks. It's an excellent one, but so expensive. Uh, I, my, my favorite one is animal Lintex. 
So you get the animal intact, you cut the, the right size and you have to, you know, make it damp, it, like make it wet. You put it on the foot and then I like to put the little swimmer's diaper and then vet wrap around and then duct tape around. Uh, and the duct tape and Dr. Uh, Coleman teaches how to make like the little duct tape on your leg, chun chun chun, and then like this, and then you put it and then duct tape everywhere. That needs to be changed every day, okay? If possible. So you actually are um, assessing what's happening all the time. And after the abscess comes out, you continue to wrap it uh, so it con can continue to drain until the hole closes a little bit, okay? Uh, a lot of the times when um, you have abscesses and you're wrapping the leg for so long, the whole hoof just becomes so soft and gummy. And so then you can start like putting dry, uh, it, maybe not even the animal intact anymore, but just the diaper and the vet wrap and the duct tape to try to harden that hoof back again. You can also put uh, betadine, just paint it. Uh, to try to harden the hoof again. Generally, abscesses is not, are not treated with um, antibiotics unless they spread to the leg and cause cellulitis. In that particular case, it needs to be treated with antibiotics as well as, um, you know, Benamine. The thing about abscesses is that you can give the horse a butte if it's lame, and if the abscess is there, it's not going to do anything. The butte is not going to do anything. So the horse will continue lame even after uh, you put, uh, you give him butte. So here is just, you know, soaking. And this, obviously this person doesn't do the way that I do. They just put the animal in text here and then they just are putting uh, the vet wrap around. I like to do the little swimmer diapers um, and then the vet wrap and then the duct tape. Now this is, you know, everybody has these guys here or a bucket. Uh, and then some people, and this is, this guys here, are my, this is my personal horse. This is one of those five liters um, IV fluid, like saline, and that's very tough plastic. And you, the, the beautiful thing about this is that you can put on the horse and leave it soaking for like an hour, go back home, cook dinner, go back there, remove it, and then put uh, your hoof bandage, okay? In the case of my particular horse, he's so active that he like destroys these things. So this thing here, then after this happened, because it doesn't accept a bucket, I went to tractor supply and got this thing here. It literally lasted seven minutes, okay? And then um, I just gave up and that's, I just do the animal in text with, the, with, with him. Um, this here is also uh, one of my horses and this, you know, the bucket, obviously she's a better creature than he is. Uh, she accepts the bucket and he does it. And this is, we we're both a root and riddle. She, because of this, and I'm going to show on the next slide, and him because of an abscess. And you can see here the, the diaper uh, and the vet wrap and the, uh, and the duct tape. And we both went there, you know, then they um, were good to each other. But what happened to her is this thing right here. Can you guys see? Uh, so wood fence is wonderful except it has a ton of nails and these nails come undone every once in a while so it's important that we look uh, at our fences and try to you know hammer back the, the the nails or just remove them and put new nails in uh, but this was she was just barely lame and i went to look and needless to say this is now it's not advisable to remove the nail yourself because we need to see first if it needs to be a surgery or not in my particular case, uh, it was like 9 p.m. It was January. I called uh, my vet, that is the podiatrist, and I was like, ah, this is what's happened. He's like, can you just wash her hoof and then inject, uh, you know, betadine inside or, or um, hydrogen peroxide, wrap it real well, and then bring her first thing tomorrow morning. And this is what I did. And then when we put contrast for some miracle, she was able to miss every important structure uh, but it's still a pain and we have, to, we had to wrap this thing for a long time. As I'm wrapping this thing for a long time and having to inject things into the hole, um, it can see how gummy it became, like her whole hoof, hoof is so soft. And let me see if you guys can see this. Oh. It opened up on, so it started to communicate uh, that. And it just, I was just like, you gotta be kidding me, right? Um, so 
but she's okay now. This was over a year ago. And it's just like, it got to a point that I was just like, you know what? I'm going to turn this thing out and pray to God and hope that everything will turn out okay. Uh, removing a sprung shoe, that's, that is an emergency because if this shoe is nailed on and got sprung, it can actually cause uh, problems to the horse. So, and that goes back to, and if Dr. Coleman is going to have like an equipment thing, I'm sure he's going to bring farrier equipment uh, and tools, but you need to learn how to remove a shoe. So next time that you're a farrier, if you don't know how to do this yet, you need to actually learn how to remove a shoe for, especially for emergencies. One of the things I didn't know is that when you are doing this thing here, you have to actually bring the shoe or the, or the, the shoe puller towards the middle of the hoof. It, it removes the nails a little bit more clean. Um, this, I think it's called crease uh, nail puller, something like that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Coleman. You're correct. Okay, this is the best thing ever created, okay? Because it's the easiest one to remove nails. And, um, but anyway, this is important. And one of the things that uh, I think is important too is for us to have some sort of training on how to help horses in, when they find themselves in situations like this. Clearly you cannot pick up the leg and remove from there. You can try to remove the shoe. You can try to probably the best thing here is to cut the wire. And, uh, but this is the problem with uh, shoes and stalls and wire like goes back to domesticating horses, okay? Um, and anytime that there is a shoe that got lost in the field, guess what? Somebody needs to go find it, okay? Because lost shoes can cause horrible problems, okay? It can be uh, life ending for a horse. So this is not something you want to find. This here, not that bad, but this guy here, very bad. Okay. Another emergency is fever. There is a fever now. I don't know if you know, going around, not just in Kentucky, but in Kentucky and Florida, it's going around in a lot of places that nobody actually knows what's happening. They think maybe a type of coronavirus, not the one that, you know, humans are getting, uh, but these horses are not colicky, but they just have a lot of fever going on. And, uh, Fever is always an emergency. So you, when you see that your horse is hot and in the absence of like, he wasn't vaccinated yesterday, uh, it can be a lot of things. If he's not sweating, so that's an emergency. Um, and again, you may need to give him Benamine, but you may also need to call the vet to see what's going on because some very serious diseases are going to cause uh, fever in these horses. And then when a horse has fever and the horse is sick, it's important to give him um, some rest before we start exercising and uh, going back to whatever it is that we were doing before. Um, but the thing about fever, when they start having fever, they go off of feed, they go off of water, and then it can lead to colic, it can lead to other problems. So that's why it's important that uh, we figure out what is causing the fever as soon as we can. Okay, uh, I put here first aid while traveling. So like that list that I'm gonna send. So you just, when traveling, you just need to take the exact same thing that you're gonna have carry in a kit and uh, maybe less quantities than what you're gonna have at home. At home, you may keep it in a cabinet uh, unless you board your horse. If you board your horse, you wanna put like in a plastic tote in the tech room. So when there is an emergency, you can quickly grab uh, your first aid kit and um, go take care of the horse. One of the things that I say here is that when traveling, we need to carry halters and lead ropes where? Inside the vehicle, okay? So not just in the tack room, not just attached to the horse uh, inside the trailer, it needs to be inside your vehicle because if there is an accident and the trailer flips and the trailer happens to flip on the side of the tack room, and then you don't have access to a halter, to a lead rope or anything, it's, uh, it's a problem, okay? So that I think is very, very important. Um, safety first, there is, um, you know, firefighters a lot of the times are um, trained to deal with uh, large horse, um, you know, entrapment and they can come and help. This horse may, be, may need to be sedated or not, but um, a trailer accident is not something that we wanna have. Okay, so how do we do to prevent? And here's the thing, I'm finishing here in the next couple of minutes, and this is just gonna be 
not the nicest photos you guys are going to see, but it's important. How do we prevent? A lot of things cannot be prevented, but a lot of things can, okay? So cleanliness. Cleanliness is very important around horses. So we can't leave just, uh, you know, manure forks laying around or those, the hay forks, which is like, the, you know, with metal or, you know, like, gates with in the boat, which we're going to see here soon. So, you know, so this thing here, this doesn't belong where horses are because they, especially close to a gate, because this obviously is a gate area, they get agitated when it comes to a gate and one will shove the other one towards that. And this is what happens. Okay. So how can I prevent this? You can prevent this, but once you do this, you need to cut this guy. Okay. Whoever installed that fence didn't do a good job, especially if it's inside the, 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 the field of the horse. So goes back again, cleanliness, okay? And neatness on things, on how to do things. Goes back to, yes, I understand. I had a nail in my own pasture that came obviously from a fence. It was an old, old nail. Uh, and there's probably more there right now. But every once in a while, you need to go around your fence line to hammer nails because eyes uh, can get cut. We can have these kinds of lacerations. Uh, all the time, okay, when we don't have a clean area. This guy here was in Colorado and it was a metal barn structure thing that was just like hanging, not, and he went under and sliced himself. So how nice, but this here took hours uh, to get done. However, do you guys see how this veterinarian didn't clip the area? Uh, it turned out, I think this is a beautiful, beautifully done job, but it could have been clipped, but it's in Colorado. It was, you know, fall, so it's getting cold. As you can see, they ended up uh, at night and uh, sometimes, you know, this, the whole thing, the whole ordeal lasted like about seven hours. So it gets to a point that you also um, want the horse to have a break. Clips, clips get clipped to noses all the time, okay? And how do I prevent this? Number one, like if you're, if you're blanketing your horse, the clip on the blanket needs to be towards the body of the horse and not towards the outside. Uh, one of my friends just had her horse with the clip to the outside when she arrived at the stall. He had effectively clipped himself to the door of the stall somehow, okay? So clips need to always be turned inwards, okay? You see this thing here? Not okay. Okay, not okay. It needs to be turned inwards, okay? Because horses get that done to their noses all the time. This bucket here, what's wrong with this bucket other than there is ice? I need somebody to unmute themselves and tell me what's wrong with this bucket. Is it hooks on the bucket, Dr. Camargo? The hooks on the bucket. What should we have done, Reed? Probably should have turned those in, maybe, if possible, or cook them um, a little bit tighter. Mm, no, this is a brand new bucket. So it's as tight as they come. But this is what we do. We put duct tape on them because horses will slice their noses or hook this to their noses all the time. So this even comes with like a little plastic thing, new bucket. So it's not just metal. They're, they're thinking, you know, it's protective. But what you need is actually duct tape on these things. And that prevents... Uh, horses' noses being hooked to that. Uh, this obviously is a manure fork laying around, horse gets out and then finds uh, the manure fork, okay? So this is just um, a nightmare. Uh, this obviously, this was caused by wire. So wire in horses is never that wonderful of an idea. And especially if you, you know, it gets cut and then, um, this again, this here is barbed wire, uh, which I understand a lot of farms have wire fences, but then it's important that the fields are large, okay? So horses are not hanging out too close to the wire. And again, you need to make sure that you check your fence line at all times. So like if you think Texas has barbed wire everywhere and uh, thousands of horses, okay? But also their fields are 10,000 acres, okay? Horses don't hang out around the fence. Most importantly, pieces of wire should not be just like laying around, okay? So I went to some farms uh, a while back and there is like hardware everywhere. 
And I'm just like, oh my gosh, uh, get your kids to like clean up all this hardware. So this is hardware is not laying around, is not okay around horses. And again, uh, do you guys see all this? This is all flesh, all like overgrown, um, you know, like the granulation tissue. This is an old injury. And then they're just like, they cannot figure out what's happening. When they took the x-ray, there is a piece of wire around. Now, this looks tightly put, so I don't know, you know, if somebody actually did it on purpose or if somebody, uh, or if this horse caught it somewhere. This uh, obviously is uh, hay net. If we're gonna put hay nets in horses, we need to be able to, number one, have a knife to come and cut him out. And number two, the only reason this horse didn't die is because it's the quietest animal I've ever seen. This is a owner that had her horse here in my place and she had this hay net hung too low. So we need to be able, we need to learn how to hang hay nets. It cannot be low because they will get themselves in trouble. Obviously, if there is something that horses can get themselves in trouble, uh, they will. So how do we prevent? Um, like this thing here, this was a kick. Uh, the veterinarian came and removed all these three. They were all milk teeth. So you, we hope that the permanent teeth don't get um, problematic. Uh, the veterinarian did a good job uh, fixing this. This picture here, and this is the last slide that I have. Uh, this picture here is a dead horse, okay, and the horse bled to death, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, this horse bled to death, was it the blanket? I don't know, I don't think it was the blanket, but it just made me look closer, and there was like a big gash right over here. If we're going to blanket horses, we need to learn how to blanket horses, okay, and we have videos that show how to blanket, but we need to put the straps correctly, and this particular strap was not correctly put on the horse, which just adds a layer of problems uh, when it comes uh, to horse ownership. We need to learn to do, because these things can de get themselves in trouble. And now we add a blanket, which um, a lot of times, you know, it's so cold that we have to. So there is some products that are okay to put on uh, wounds. Furacin, is, there is not one single study that shows that furacin is good for open flesh. It's good to sweat a leg. Uh, powders like wonder dust uh, or blue coat that spray, those are very, very toxic to the wound and never, never good to use uh, on horses' uh, open flesh. So this is me. Did I go? I don't know if I go. I never asked how long I had, but uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. That was great, Dr. Camargo. Yeah, everybody feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask any questions or put those in the chat box. Um, really makes you realize how quick accidents can happen, Dr. Camargo. Oh my gosh. And it's good, it's very important to maintain your cool, you know, but that's when those, um, a twitch, you know, or even a sedative uh, is important to have around. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. Coleman, I saw that you unmuted yourself. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, I think you made one point that uh, we all should think about. So you you commented about extra an extra halter and a lead shank and that in the vehicle. I think you should have that as a horse owner in your vehicle all the time, just because you might be able to help somebody by having a good halter and a shank and, or maybe a rope. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't used mine. I've got two halters, two lead shanks, a lariat rope and farrier tools in my truck all the time, uh, just in case. And I think it, uh, as horse people, sort of as a safety thing, that's just a good thing to have. And, and I, I'm really glad you said it the way you did because it needs to be where it's handy. Mm -hmm. and, and we quite often forget that. So um, having a little travel kit of stuff that just sits in the back of the truck or, I mean, I have mine in my toolbox, so uh, it's always there, but I think it's just a good idea. Mine is under the back seat of my truck, but yes, because we also see loose horses. So, and we may be the only person that has horse experience around to actually try to catch the horse. So, um, 
I am going, what are the basic first aid supplies we should have on a trail ride? So on a trail ride, uh, if you can like pack things such as, you know, vet wrap or a couple of towels, like to try to stop the bleeding uh, until you actually can get, go, come back to the trailhead to actually have your complete first aid uh, where you're going to have your Benamine and your other uh, products. So yes. Um, but at least in your saddlebag, if you can have some towels, uh, clean towels, and if you can have, um, you know, maybe four by four gauze, those are important uh, to do that. Or, you know, vet wrap to try to, to maintain uh, the gauze in place. So I hope that answered the question. But in your truck, you're going to have the complete first aid kit which I am going to send uh, a list uh, to Dr. Coleman and then, or to read and then, and then he can spread to you all. Any more questions? So an IV video, uh, like how to give an IV injection, is that what, it, what you're asking, Tracy? Yes. That is something, yeah, so that would be something that, and I, we can find a YouTube video um, that's nice and good, but it's probably best that your veterinarian, next time that he comes over, that he um, teaches you, okay? You can do with a syringe and a needle and try to collect blood, for example, and or if he has some sterile saline, try to inject saline in the horse. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a good question, Tracy, and it's a good answer, Dr. Camargo, and it goes with the, uh, the leg wrapping. Learn how to do that when they're standing still because, or even if you have a horse that's a little needle shy, uh, practicing on a horse that'll give you the confidence is really, really helpful. And, and I think there's a lot of times we think we know how to do it till uh, he's jumping around or she's jumping around and and you're losing your cool and uh, make good use of your veterinarian to help you. That's a great suggestion, Dr. Camargo. No, and Dr. Coleman said it right, because when uh, the horse has put himself and is in need of first aid and has put himself in a pickle and now you're nervous because you don't know and the horse is bleeding and then now everybody's agitating, feeding off of each other. Uh, if you are not proficient into you know, getting a needle on his jugular vein, you, that's not the time to learn. And nobody's going to do well in that condition. So, um, one of the things that I wanted to say, just real quick here, Reed, is that uh, about colic, when do we take this horse to the hospital for surgery? And I think that that's a decision that you have to make tonight. Okay. Do not wait for colic to happen and then, in the heat of the moment, make the decision because some people, a colic surgery, we're talking about ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Okay. So, when we, when the horse is in uh, a bad situation, every horse owner is going to want to do the best for the horse and say, yes, let's do, go for surgery. And a lot of the times we find ourselves not being able to pay for our own bills because we have done that. So it's just a decision that needs to be made the same, like with the IV and the, in the leg wrap when there is cool in your head, not in the agitation of the moment. Are there any pointers you would give to uh, horse owners to prevent colic? Maybe things they could do to, I know it's pretty common and, and a lot of horse owners go through that. Is there anything you'd recommend maybe as a prevention tool? Sure. So uh, like I said, so the GI tract of the horse lends itself like, you know, the perfect place for colic. Now, how do we do? So there is a lot of things that can be done. So don't change your feed, uh, you know, super fast. So you need to like slowly, if you're going to change feed, uh, you know, so the, so the GI tract, so the bacteria can acclimate uh, themselves. Uh, obviously, good quality hay is the best, um, you know, as opposed to super coarse. Now, that's bad for a fat horse because a fat horse eating good quality hay will gain even more weight or you have to give so little hay and so little hay in the gut can lead to colic. So it's like something that's a little hard. Uh, Turn out, so moving around, going outside, that's uh, preventative. Plenty of fresh water. Horses need to drink water at whenever they want to. Obviously, if you're working cattle and there is no water to be drunk at this moment, right? But as the horse comes back, you need to give plenty of fresh water. Um, 
one of the things that horses need to is a routine. So if you feed this horse at six in the morning, you can't one day six in the morning, the next day at nine, the next day at seven, the next day at noon. This is not, doesn't work for horses, okay? It needs to be very routine because they get very agitated. And colic is something that more agitated horses have more than more calm horses. So an agitated horse, if he comes the time and he doesn't see you, he starts to feed off of himself and gets agitated. And that's a type of colic, it's called spasmodic and it can create that. Uh, so anything that we do with horses, um, but it, like feed wise, hay wise, um, saliva, like chewing at all times, that helps buffer uh, and you know water and routine. Routine is important. Dr. Coleman, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, the one thing I would add is, is the water. Uh, and uh, especially right now, uh, a lot of times people think, well, you know, it's okay, they can eat the snow. It, it's not the same. It is not the same. Uh, they may survive, but, but it really goes kind of hand in hand with the quality of the forage. But right now, in, in the kind of weather we've been having, making sure they're drinking enough water is really really critical because uh, it's a great time especially if you get some of that lower quality forage uh, they're picking through because the snow kept us from getting another bailout to them uh, that's a good time to have that happen and i, I noticed uh where did it go um kenton yeah yeast is it's one of those things that uh, we're not really sure why it works, but like you, I've, I have put it in rations for horses and had the colic maybe not go away completely, but been greatly reduced. And, and I really wish, I think it does aid in fiber digestion. Uh, and it, it seems, I mean, your, your comment <laughs> that it's worked for you, uh, you're not the first person in the last, many years of doing this that has said that and, and I really wish I knew exactly why it worked but the fact it does work maybe I don't need to know. I, I, I have I add probiotics and feed and, and yeast to mine also uh, like and I and I, I my horses have had some things but my personal horses have never colic a day in their lives and I've owned horses so my personal okay and I've owned horses since I was a child. So somehow um, that does help. But I've been doing that, the yeast and the other probiotics, uh, Dr. Coleman, for like the last, you know, many, many years, like 12 years. Um, one of the things that we cannot prevent, though, Reed, is this cold. Okay, weather change in Kentucky is something that happens. And when it gets, when it goes from 50 degrees to 20 in one night, horses immediately stop drinking water. So we need to encourage them uh, to drink water. If it is going to be by adding Gatorade, if it's going to be by you know adding molasses to the water, but the, the, the secret to that is not to add Gatorade the night the horses don't wanna drink. It's to add Gatorade at all times and then they are accustomed to that taste. Yeah. Great, thanks. That was a really, really good presentation by the way. It was just makes you really think about how quickly accidents can happen and, and how easily horses can get hurt. So one of the, a friend of mine, very good friend of mine. So they were putting, this was a month ago, they have a very valuable foal, uh, like a, a yearling. And they were putting hay out, like a round bale out for the, for the, for the horses. And they, as soon as like they did the round bale, instead of like backing up and like lifting the steer, like you have to lift to the sky, right? Uh, they just didn't, they just moved like this and the horses got agitated and went and sliced the entire horse on the side. So, but you can easily see how it could actually have speared the horse, right? And it's just like, okay, so you people don't know how to deal with the tractor. So it has nothing to do with anything except learn how to deal with the tractor and lift the thing. It's just common sense. So, yeah, but they can get themselves in trouble so quickly. Does anybody else have any questions while you're thinking? Um, I just want to remind everybody, please continue to hold the date for the spring trail ride. It's going to be May the 20th through the 23rd at the South Fork Elk View. Um, 
we're really, really, really hoping that we get to uh, get to have it this year. Um, and our next class is about tack and equipment in this series. Um, it's on March 18th. Dr. Coleman, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, we're going to go to my tack room, if you can see in the picture. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk about some of the basic things. We'll probably talk a little bit too, uh, you know, getting ready getting ready for that trail ride. Maybe we're already riding, but I, I see a lot of times uh, when we go to, to tax sales or tax swaps where we're not cleaning our stuff, that there's places that we can look that if it's going to break, that's where it's going to be. And, and it's a lot sort of in the same vein as Dr. Camargo's presentation is let's think about uh, what can we do to, to prevent things? You know, which way does the snap go? Well, Let's look around the buckle. Let's look at the how our, our reins are attached, how the bits attached, those sorts of things, just to just to make sure. Yeah, you know, you don't want to get to the trail ride, unload the horses, you put the saddle on, and then as you're putting your bridle on, it breaks. It's like so you get to either ride with your halter or you get to stay at the trailer and wave at everybody as they leave. So we don't want to do that. The other thing, and Dr. Camargo mentioned about the uh, farrier tools. Uh, we're actually going to have Mitch Taylor talk about that specifically and kind of go through those basic steps of how to pull a shoe uh, because, and, and again, uh, to sort of support Dr. Camargo's tools that she had on there. I mean, those are what I have, uh, plus I have a hammer and a couple of other things, but uh, having had recently had to pull shoes at the barn. One of them was for my horse and no tools with me. And it's really hard to pull a shoe off with a pair of pliers and a claw hammer and not tear the foot up, which had me pretty worried, but we got it done. So I think there's some of those really basic things, but we're gonna look at, at some different pieces and parts to, to equipment, talk a little bit about bits, about what makes them do what they do and uh, not that I expect anybody's going to change their bridles, but at least understand what you're putting in your horse's mouth or not uh, and why. Um, because, again, it, it can prevent some things. It can make everybody happier, and on we go. And so hopefully we'll be in Breathitt County with some stuff face-to-face. -face. I will certainly, if we get to be face-to-face, -face, I'll bring some stuff with me. I have a, a little collection that I like to take along and, and we'll talk about some of the basic things that you can consider and you know a lot of things that we're now doing tacking equipment wise that we never did 25 30 years ago uh, you know you put your saddle pad on you put your saddle on you cinched it up or you did up the girth and on you end and now we think about how does it fit do i have the right pad do i have too much pad do i have not enough pad all those sorts of things that have now, we've now learned that there's a reason for doing it and it makes our horses a lot happier. So that's what we should be striving to do. So I'm looking forward to the 18th. Yeah, definitely. Did you see um, David's question about salt, Dr. Camargo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. Um... So salt is great. Um, I don't love it. Uh, some horse, it's I just say it's great, but I don't love it. Um, salt, horses that you have salt for them to lick, it can be loose salt, it can be a block at all times. Okay, this is something that horses crave. Now, adding salt to the feed is something that some people do it, and it's something that I don't totally love. Um, if the horse, if salt is added to the feed and the horse does indeed drink more water because of it, because it's supposed to stimulate the thirst reflex. So you have more salt, you drink more water, it's you know supposed to help. However, if the horse is one of those stubborn horses and he is just like, I you know what, I am not drinking water, it's too cold and I'm just not. The salt is actually going to effectively dehydrate the horse faster than without the salt. So the salt lick that the horse is just gonna lick is one thing separate. They have to have that at all times. Adding salt to the feed, in my personal uh, opinion and my personal experience, I actually had a horse here that the owner gave electrolytes every single day. 
and the horse colic every two weeks. And I'm, to the point that after like the seventh time, I just said, and the electrolyte is never gonna be given to this horse ever again. And she's like, no, but he's usually like, that's why your horse is colicking. And needless to say, the day we stopped, the horse never colicked again. So certain things, so the person has done this forever. Oh, he does just colicky, oh, sorry. No, you're, you're making your horse colic by giving something he doesn't need. So yeah, I am not, I don't do salt like this. Uh, horses that trail ride and they're super, super uh, sweaty and they lose so much sodium. So, you know, uh, electrolyte paste at that point, especially if the horse is going to drink more water, uh, that's okay. But on a day to day, like in the winter, just to try to stimulate them to drink, I wouldn't do it because if they don't end up drinking the next morning, they're going to be super dehydrated. Does that answer your question, David? Dr. Coleman, do you, do you have anything to add? Well, if, if we're feeding a concentrate, it's already got salt in it. So you're right. I mean, adding more, I, I, I don't see the value in it. And I, and I think we get too carried away. Um, your example is a good one, Dr. Camargo. I mean, oh, we have to do this. No, we don't. I mean, it, if we need to, a dehydrated, you know, a horse that sweats a lot, doesn't eat much salt. Yeah, probably. I mean, now if they're not drinking very much water, I'd also see if there's a way that I could warm it up a little bit. Because we know if you've got the water, you know, about 40 degrees, they'll drink more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's some of the research says it's got to be 55 to 60 degrees. That's going to be pretty hard on a day like today. But if you can get it so that it's just a little warmer, um, I think you'll find that they'll drink more. And that's probably, uh, that's not all that hard to do. If it's a, a water tank, putting a, uh, one of those stock heaters in just to keep it from freezing, keep it so that the horses can't get to the stock heater or the cord. Um, and I mean, I'd actually, if I had a stock tank, I'd put a wooden lid on it keep my heater underneath the lid and leave a portion of the tank open for the horses to drink from. And, and I think you'll find that if just taking the chill off, they'll drink more. And, and for horses that are in stalls, if you have a heated bucket, uh, obviously the thing about heated buckets, which is great because you don't have to break ice from buckets is uh, great because the water does stay a little warm. Some buckets warmer than others. The problem with that is that they can cause fire in a barn. So like in my particular uh, uh, experience here and what, what I do in my place, uh, I added a timer because uh, I have, I think I have 12 horses in. I added a timer and the timer like shuts off the electric to the barn uh, at like one o'clock in the morning. So they have been there since five. Uh, I go in at about nine or 10 to check, make sure that everybody has water and hay, top some waters here and then at one o'clock, it shuts off the, the heated buckets. And uh, so if they drank by then, great. If they didn't, their water is not gonna freeze immediately. So they still have some time to drink. And then at five o'clock, they get turned out. And outside I have automatic waters that don't freeze, but you need to check also, but because they have a heater inside. Uh, one of the things to uh, stimulate them drinking is to throw hay close to the water. So they don't have to walk so far away to go get a drink of water. Um, and in the summer, make them walk far, far away from the water so they can actually exercise. Now, now you're stimulating them to drink. In the summer, like in spring, when the grass is so rich, you're trying to make them walk a little bit more than just like eating and then drinking. So, yeah. But I have a horse, my Palomino is not allowed to have heated buckets. So he breaks ice with his feet. And then you see the little hole in the bucket that because he plays with the cord and he will be the cause for the entire barn to burn and him to get electrocuted. So I'm just like, eh, now try to think what kind of horse you want to be for the rest of your life. You know, this winter he's learning. So we'll see. It's definitely been a tough time for, for having livestock the past few days. I think we can all agree with that on here. Um, it makes you think there there are easier ways to do it, like you were talking about the heated buckets and things. And plus, it promotes you know horse health. Mm -hmm. Just got to be careful; those buckets have been known to be 
one of the top causes of barn fires in Kentucky. Everywhere. And all you usually find after the fire is the is the heating coil from the bottom of the bucket. That'll be left. Nothing else will be. So you got to be really careful with them. It's that as Dr. Camargo said, you rather got to shut them off. You've got to make sure that they don't drain. They they can't get empty. Mm -mm. They continue to heat. Yep. And also your barn uh, needs to have all the wires, you know, like done by somebody, an electrician and inside conduit. So it doesn't, so the mice and rodents don't go and like bite on the wire because the heated buckets will draw a lot of electricity. Uh, and then if these wires are not proper, um, then it's even more chance of uh, barn fires. So, yeah. I guess on my end, just one more quick question. Um, this is to the group. Uh, is, are people interested in, in coming in person if we have a, like a hybrid meeting um, with Dr. Coleman? next month in March. I know it's a long time away to think, but if you'll just kind of put that in the chat box, uh, just as a poll to the group, if you would be interested in coming in person in March, um, because there will be a lot of effort that goes into it on our part to, to host a meeting, you know, both ways, but we definitely want to keep doing this as a Zoom meeting. I mean, we've had a great participation in both our first meetings. So, uh, but we, we also just really want to ask if, if you would be interested in coming in person in March, if we are able to have it. So if somebody could just, just unmute, um, type that in the chat box, and uh, that would really, really help me gauge what, what it's going to be like for March. I'd like to be back. I'd like to come in person. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Marcia. I'm seeing several yeses. Um, I know it depends on the day. We'll, it'll be um, the next meeting will be March 18th at 6 p.m. Kenton. We'll do the best we can to be in person. Yep. Well, I'll submit us a plan and uh, hopefully get it approved. And I'll let everybody know um, through email how it's going. I'll send out this recording as soon as. Uh, as soon as I find out something, we'll kind of get a plan together for that. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Camargo or, or even Dr. Coleman? Um, we've got some great resources on the line here tonight and got their attention. So uh, you may want to use them. As always, though, you can contact me and I can get a hold of them for you. Um, if you have any questions that come up afterwards. I'd like to share a, a tip that I learned um, dealing with a, a long-term uh, bandaging issue. Um, I had a, a horse who pawed at a low, uh, smooth wire that's separating two adjoining pastures and nearly cut off the ball of his, heel, of his uh, hoof. Um, so this was a long-term dressing procedure. And one thing that I found that was very, very helpful was to use um, a folded section of bounty paper towel after the wound was cleaned and before I put any other gauze or anything on it. Um, put the paper towel on top of the wound to absorb any exudate. I had been using sterile gauze on the wound, but every time I took the sterile gauze off, it was peeling off the newly formed tissue. And the paper towel absorbed exudate, but it didn't tear off the new tissue. And it really um, allowed for better um, healing faster than it than it than I was seeing otherwise. And I just thought I'd share that. Good idea. Does it have to be bounty? <laughs> it absorbs. Well, it needs to be something. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I have stock. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just. Kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, it obviously something that's very absorbent. So it doesn't break. Um, you know. doesn't break. Like it's harder to break. So you don't leave like pieces of paper behind. Right, exactly. Yes. Good idea. See, now and we learned something. We can go. I have a tip for uh, ice in the buckets and in the troughs. So we get like, first of all, to break, as I have a little mallet, 
to break the ice instead of like an ax, like four buckets. Otherwise I'll break the whole bucket. But if it's just ice floating like this, I get one of those like things like the strand, like how do you even call it? I have it here in my kitchen. Like that has like a little- Strainer. That, and then scoop the ice out instead of like using your hands. Cause then like your hands get too cold. So we use that, throw the ice out. I hate winter. So I am going to send uh, that first aid thing to you um, all to read and Dr. Coleman and then they can share. And then, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate um, to contact, you know, me or Reed or Dr. Coleman at any time. Yep. Definitely, I agree. Dr. Camargo, we can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. It's always a great pleasure to listen to your talks. We've got to hear a few through the years so far and uh, Definitely, thank you for your time. If yeah, nobody else has any questions, I guess this is uh, this is the end of our um, February meeting. I can't thank you all enough either for getting on tonight and joining us. Dr. Stay Holmes, warm. All right. We will. Thank Thanks again. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.